You guys ready for the Word of God today, this morning? It's truly a powerful Word today. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 30, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. It's just one verse. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Then Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. What does it mean to be oppressed by the devil? We're going to learn that this morning. But before we get started, let's just pray. And I want you guys to truly pray to God right now. Because I believe this is going to be one of the most powerful messages of the year. And Father, I just ask that today you would anoint this room with your presence. For all those, Lord, who need a word from you, who are listening right now by podcast, online, or here presently, I pray you give us this discernment, Lord, and eyes to see the truth, that you would set us free from demonic oppression. Help us to understand what it means and how to get over it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat as we go into the Word of God today. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus went about, the Bible says, doing good. And when we look at the life of Jesus, everyone would agree with that. We would hear stories like the feeding of the 5,000, that Jesus multiplied the fish and the loaves and fed over 20,000 people. We would hear stories like Mary Magdalene who was about to be stoned to death because she was caught in adultery and Jesus came in and he really rescued her from that and spared her life. We even read stories like Jesus calming down the storm and saving the disciples from drowning. And then the Bible says he went around doing good and all of us say, yeah, he did good things. And we look at the Bible and the Bible says he went about healing. The Bible says that Jesus healed, and there's great stories of Jesus healing the blind and the crippled. We know that Jesus healed the possessed. Those had had a demon within themselves, controlling them. But here in the book of Acts, for the first time, there's a whole other idea of what Jesus did in his ministry that's not really mentioned in the gospel And the Bible says that Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were not possessed, but all who were oppressed by the devil. And there is a big, vast difference between being oppressed and being possessed. You see, when you have been possessed by a demon... The idea of that word possession means to have full control over. It's actually when a demonic spirit enters a a person's body and is able to control them and manipulate their behavior and their actions and their thoughts. And the fact is that demonic possession is very, very, let me say this clearly, very rare. The fact that churches claim to have a lot of demon-possessed people rolling around on the floor, foaming in the mouth, that is not demonic possession. You might say, well, pastor, I know someone who is possessed by a demon. Chances are that's not true. And the reason is that in order for a demon to take full possession of a person, just like being a Christian having the Holy Spirit take full control in your life, it's an act of surrender. In other words, you surrendered your life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit came and now lives in you. The same goes with the demonic realm. In order for a person to have been possessed, they have to completely surrender their life and their will to the devil. In order for a person to be controlled and possessed by a demon, they have to surrender their life and be involved in things like the occult. Things that have to do with the demonic realm. So the person that just says, well, I have to be careful because Satan can just come around and and really just enter anyone, it's not true. 
A person has to be willing and able, like we were willing and able to surrender our lives to Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. A same person has to be able and willing to surrender their life to the occult and the demonic realms and invite the devil in. This is how possession takes place. So when you get involved like things like Santeria and witchcraft and all the demonic things, that's where you're literally inviting and surrendering yourself to the demonic realm. So Jesus had people that were clearly possessed by demons. And he healed them. But in the book of Acts, the Bible says that Jesus healed those who were oppressed. Now, there is a big difference now between being possessed and being oppressed. That word oppressed means to put a burden on. It's when someone has authority and someone has power, but they're abusing that authority, abusing that power to put burdens on you. So how many of you are Cuban right now? You're Cuban, right? How many have parents that were from Cuba or came from Cuba? Okay, so you would understand that Castro, he had power and authority, right? But he used that power and authority to put burdens on the people of Cuba. He oppressed the people of Cuba. That's what oppression is. The devil has power. The devil has authority. And the devil uses that power and authority to put oppression and burden on the people of God. So though a Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit and cannot be possessed by a demon, a Christian and a born-again, God-fearing believer can, however, be oppressed by the devil. So possession involves full control. And as a believer, you have to worry nothing about that. If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, there is no vacancy. The demons cannot enter you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. So you're probably thinking, Oof, I'm safe. No, you're not. Because though the demons cannot possess you internally, they can oppress you outwardly. So Satan knows, I can get in there, but I'm not going to stop there. Let me explain this to you through a, a cake. So I went to the store and I bought this cake. How many of you want this cake after church? You're like, yeah, it's beautiful, chocolate lovers, great. As I, as I ordered this cake, the woman did something Interesting. She, she got this, this box, and now, if I can open it, as she got this box, she placed the cake inside it. Got it? So now, when you look at this cake, you say, it's protected, right? She didn't just hand me the cake bare. She put it in the box to really protect us, to protect the cake. So this cake now has this kind of covering and a shield to protect it from anything coming inside and ruining the cake. See, when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is the same covering you have. When you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the devil knows he can't get inside you. He knows he can possess you. He knows that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have been washed by the blood of Jesus. There is a hedge of protection. You are covered by his blood. He knows and says, I cannot possess you. I cannot go inside. I can't possess you. You got it? But the devil says, I'm not going to stop there. So what the devil does, even though this cake is covered, what happens if I all of a sudden place a burden on it? What just happened? 
Let me ask you a question, church. Is this cake still covered? Is it still protected? Yes. But notice, all I had to do was put a burden on it. The word oppression has the word press on it. It's the idea of Satan says, I can't get inside you, but I will make a mess out of you through the outside. I will oppress you. And what's happening today is that we have a lot of Christians that are saying, man, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm a believer. I'm covered by the blood. I'm covered. And it's true. But how many of you know a lot of believers are a mess today? There's a lot of God-fearing Christians on their way to heaven whose lives here on earth are a mess. There's a lot of Christians whose families are a mess, whose marriages are a mess, whose lives are a mess. The only difference is you're saved. You're born again. You're a believer. But this is what the devil wants to do to you. The devil knows he can't possess you but he can oppress you. He can put burdens on you in order to make a mess. So he knows that he can use physical means and mental and emotional means to get you to be a mess. So even though you're saved, even though you're born again, even though you're going to church, even though you die and you're on your way to heaven, the devil knows I'm not going to stop. I know that through my power and my authority, I can put burdens on you. And there is a lot of believers that have burdens on them right now. They're being attacked all around. Consider Job in the Bible. A man of God, a God-fearing man who prayed every day and sacrificed and prayed for his children. That even God says there's no one like him. He's blameless. And the devil oppressed him. Attacked him. The devil attacked his health. The devil attacked his children. The devil attacked his finances. The devil attacked his business. The devil attacked his marriage. The Bible calls that Job was going through depression. Job went through guilt. And as I saw Job's friends, and they were accusing him of doing something wrong in chapter 4, what's interesting is one of his friends says, hey, you know I had a dream, light, uh, a dream last night, and in my mind this person visited me and told me you're at fault? Where did that vision come from? It was demonic. The devil wanted to put Job on this burden of guilt and shame and condemnation. The devil wanted to attack him in the faith by using outward measures. So that's what the devil says. The devil knows, I can't possess Job, but I can oppress him. I can make him go through depression. I can make him go through guilt. I can attack his marriage. I can attack his health. I can attack his family. I'm going to go after his children. I'm going to go through Job's faith, but I'm going to use outward things. I'm going to use health. I'm going to use storms. I'm going to use sickness. I'm going to use his marriage. I'm going to put his wife against him. I'm going to divide the family. I'm going to destroy his home, and I don't have to possess him at all. Do you understand that the devil knows he can't possess you and he doesn't care? He wants to oppress. And today, I believe that in the church, a vast majority of believers are under some type of demonic oppression. 
and you go to the church and you worship and you listen to the sermon and you read the Bible, but you go home and there's depression, there's fear, there's shame, there's guilt, there's anxiety, there's this demonic attack in the home, in the family, in the marriage, there's addiction, there's bondage, and you're saved. If you're real with yourself, you can say, Lord, I thank you that I'm saved. I thank you that I'm covered. But Lord, the truth is, I'm a mess. My life is a mess. Everything around me feels like I'm burdened. I'm burdened by addiction. I'm burdened by emotional bondage. I'm burdened by anger. I'm burdened by anxiety and fear and worry and jealousy and pride and bitterness. I'm burdened. So I can't fully enjoy my relationship with you. I can't fully enjoy my salvation in the Lord. I can't enjoy my worship to God because my life is being so pressed. It's being so oppressed by the enemy that every day it feels like when I wake up, the devil says, good morning. Good morning. Let me put some anger in you. Let me put some fear in you. Let me put some bad habits in you. Why don't you get angry today? Why don't you get jealous today? Hey, why why don't you just go and do that sin again? I want to press on you. And the reality is, this is what believers look like today. You have something beautiful on the inside. Wasn't that cake beautiful? But because of the devil and demonic oppression and burdens on you, your life's a mess. And even though the cake's beautiful and covered, it's going to be hard to enjoy. You know how many Christians have no joy? Suppression. And I'm preaching this because the church is leading people the wrong way, telling them, you're fine, you're safe, you're protected to some degree. But we don't talk about oppression anymore. And I understand that a believer cannot be possessed demonically. So people think, well, I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry at all. I I can enjoy my life in peace knowing that the blood of of God covers me. I don't have to worry about any type of satanic involvement in my life. If that were so, stay with me. Why would God warn us, believers, so many times about the devil? If you had nothing to worry about when it comes to the devil, why was 1 Peter 5, 8 written? 1 Peter 5.8 that says, Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the what? The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Peter wrote this to a church. Not to ungodly pagan people, but to Christian, believing, God-fearing Christians that are in the church. He said, be alert, watch out, the devil is there, he wants you. Why was James 4, 7 written to another church, to another believer? Humble yourself before God. Resist the what? Devil. So he will flee from you. Why does Luke 22, verse 31, why did Jesus look at Peter who was following Jesus and and Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat? This was right after Peter clearly confessed that Jesus was Lord and his Savior. He was born again. He was saved. He was walking with Jesus. And Jesus said, be careful. The devil wants you. One of the greatest warnings in the Bible to a church and to Christians and believers is Ephesians 4.26. It says, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. 
For anger gives a foothold to who? The devil. That word foothold literally translates opportunity. Do you know that by your emotions and the way you live your life, you can give the devil an opportunity to oppress you? You're allowing the devil to say, come on, burden me, press on me, make my life a mess. Throughout the Bible, it warns us, us believers, us Christians in the church, it warns us that the devil is not only real, he's after you. So don't let anyone deceive you by thinking, oh, you're saved, the devil can't touch you. Says who? He can't possess you, absolutely. I'm never gonna, I hope I never get a call saying, Lord, uh, my, my children, my wife, my husband, their heads are spinning and they're vomiting like the actual. I'm, I may not ever get a call like that. But I do get phone calls that say, uh, Pastor, my, my child is going through depression. My marriage is under attack. My health is in crisis. I'm emotionally in bondage. I'm addicted to this. I'm living in fear. I'm living in worry. I get those calls on a weekly basis because I am reminded every day the devil is real. And he doesn't leave believers alone. So do not think because you're covered that he won't press on you and burden you and really make a mess of your life. The majority of believers are a mess today. We shout and cry victory, we worship and sing praises, but we're a mess. Examine yourself and be honest and say, yeah, I'm a mess right now. Emotionally, I'm a mess. My family's a mess. My spouse and I, we're a mess. My mind and my health is a mess. And that's what the devil wants. So I want to do you a favor today. And teach you. Because 2 Timothy 3.16 says, one of the most powerful verses, all scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach. So I already scratched that out. I taught you the difference between oppression and possession. Could you say, I got it? All right. So all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is true to make us realize, that word realize is a Greek word that means to expose and bring out. So this is where we're going to get into now. Get excited. This is awesome. Because you know what the devil's going to, he's mad because we're going to expose him today. We're going to bring the truth out. So the Bible says to make us realize or expose what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So we've gone through the teaching. Let's go through the, just the revealing. Let's expose this devil right now. And then we'll get to the correction so that you can never live a life oppressed again. How many want that for your life? You really sound like you do. You're thinking, well, pastor, how does a Christian get oppressed? I understand I'm free, protected, covered, no possession. I don't have to worry about that. Honey, I'm sorry I called you the devil. I know it's not inside you. Honey, I know I understand. How does a Christian get oppressed? Number one, it's going to be like, what, are you kidding me? But listen, number one. God allows it. You're thinking, wait, that's not fair. Yeah, it is. God allows it. Throughout scriptures, it's proven that Satan asked God for permission. And throughout scripture, God said, yeah, 
Attack them. Do it. We know that Satan asked permission to attack Job. And in the end, Job was blessed. We know that Satan asked Peter, Satan asked Jesus to attack Peter, and Jesus said yes. You're probably thinking, well, why, why does God allow the devil to attack? Doesn't God love us? Doesn't God protect us? But don't you understand because God loves you and God protects you, he has to allow the devil to attack you. You're thinking, how is that even possible? 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul said this. Even though I received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger from where? Satan. To torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Do you understand that Paul noticed that God allowed notice? The Bible says it was given to me. The thorn was given to me. I didn't ask for it. I didn't invite it in. It was given. Given by who? Given by God. And the reason that God allowed this devil to attack Paul was to develop him spiritually. It was to help him with his pride. See, maybe Paul was getting a little cocky, a little arrogant. Maybe the ministry in the high position got to his head. Maybe Paul thought he was important and God said, wait a minute, I have to teach him a lesson. Devil, would you attack him now and remind him how weak he is? So that he remembers that who he is is, is through me. And God allowed the devil to attack him and torment him to the point that Paul said, please, God, remove this three times. He said, God, please remove this. And God said, no. My grace is enough. My power is made known in weakness. So after Paul passed this test, he realized if I didn't, if I was never attacked by the devil, I would have stayed with this pride. And this pride would have messed me up. So God allowed it. God allowed the devil to attack Job. And Job was blessed. God allowed the devil through Jesus to attack Peter. And Peter grew and matured because of it. You understand that God allows the devil to attack, to develop you, and to bless you. Remember when Jesus was in the desert and he was tested by the devil? The Bible says right before that the Holy Spirit led him there. Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus to a desert where the devil is? Well, to be tempted, but the word tempt in the Greek actually means tested. And when you are tested, it's to improve and strengthen and grow. So it's no wonder the Holy Spirit said, come this way. Let me bring you to a demonic attack. So that it will test you. So that it will bless you. This is why oppression happens. God allowed it. That's one reason. The second reason is going to offend you. Because I want you to notice a huge demonic lie in the church. It's such a lie that I guarantee, maybe online, you're going to write me an email. And you're going to get offended. And I'm not going to care. Ready? 
But I want you to understand something about, in Scripture, everyone that was attacked by the devil through God was already in position of ministry. They were walking in their calling or in some type of position of leadership. Got it? Because in the Bible, Satan attacked those who were in position, already walking in their calling, and already in some type of power. Think about Job. Job was in position of ministry. Well, the Bible doesn't say he was in ministry. Yes, it does. The Bible says that above anyone, he was like, there was no one else like him. Everyone knew that Job feared God. Job would use his life and his business and his family and his lifestyle to demonstrate what it looks like to fear God. That's a ministry. The devil attacked. Peter was attacked by the devil only after Peter confessed Jesus as Lord and got saved and was walking with him. You understand that Paul was attacked by the devil only after he got saved and turned his life around and accepted the call of God in his life and he's in ministry? Do you know that the devil attacked Jesus only when he was 30 years old? Why 30? Because 30 was the mark of the start of his calling and ministry. You say, well, pastor, what's the point? Here is one of the biggest demonic lies in the church today. You ready to get offended? The devil does not attack you because you have potential. (gasps) You hear youth pastors say it to young people. The devil is after you because he knows you're called. He knows that you're a threat. He knows what you're going to do. The de- Someone's going to come up to you and say, well, this is happening because there's a call of God on your life. That is not biblical. Nowhere in the Bible does the devil ever attack someone because they have a gift and potential. The truth is, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue at 12 years old. If a 12-year-old walked up here and started preaching, everyone here would say they have a calling. Everyone would say, Pastor David, step aside. They have talent. Jesus was preaching at 12. Where in the Bible does the devil attack him at 12? The devil is not omniscient. The devil is not all-knowing. The devil is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at once. He's not in the future knowing, oh, I know what you're going to do. I'm going to attack you now. It is not biblical. And it's a demonic lie because there are many people in the church that say, the devil is attacking me because I'm gifted. And they ignore that maybe the devil is attacking you because God is preparing you or you're in sin. But the devil says, no, 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 it's because you're gifted. That's why your life's a mess. It's because you're called. That's why your life's a mess. It's because you have potential. Hey, I'm tired of that word. Potential means nothing if you don't do it. And the devil attacks you when you're doing it. But see, it feels good to know the devil is threatened by you. The devil is only threatened by you when you're living your calling. The devil didn't know I was going to be a pastor. And everything I went through as a teenager, a kid, it was because of life. The devil attacked me after I was in ministry. After I said yes to God. So don't let any fool tell you you're being attacked because you have a calling on your life. The devil doesn't know that. The devil only knows what he sees. Not what he foresees, because he can't foresee anything but his future, his destiny, 
being thrown in the lake of fire. That's the only thing he knows about his future. Amen. So you're saying, Pastor, I'm under attack, but it's not because I'm gifted. No, it's not. It's not because you have a gift. It's not because you have potential. Maybe you're under attack because of two reasons. Because God's allowing it to develop your character. And maybe it's the second reason. The reason that we get demonically oppressed is because of sin. See how quiet it got? Because we don't like to hear this. And the truth is, through the blood of Jesus, you're saved. He saved us. He's cleansed us from sin. We are, however, we are responsible to rid ourselves from behaviors and thought patterns and emotions and choices that make us vulnerable for demonic oppression. Because let me expose something about the demonic realm that's going to save you here. Demons are environmental. That means that demons are creatures that can only thrive in the right environment, the right surroundings. A fish is only its best in water, right? You take that fish out of the water, it's no longer swimming. It's no longer doing what it's supposed to do because it's out of its environment. Demons operate in the same manner. In order for a demon to have strength and thrive in your life and your family in your home, you have to create an atmosphere where it belongs. You have to create an environment where it feels comfortable. Let me prove this to you. In the Bible, Mark chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus looks at a man that was possessed by a demon. This man was possessed, not oppressed. He was possessed. But the Bible makes an interesting note. With a shriek, when Jesus walked into the garrisons and he stepped into the cemetery where it was an unclean place, this demonic spirit screamed, Why are you interfering with me? He told Jesus. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, because we are many there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirit begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. And there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. And notice what the evil spirit said. Send us into the pigs. Now you're thinking, why? What happened? Why are they begging him? It's because in the Hebrew and Jewish culture, pigs, according to God in the Old Testament, pigs were considered unclean and unholy. Did you catch that? Pigs were considered to be unclean. And in the Bible, the word unclean means not pleasant or fitting for God. So the demons were begging to be in an environment that was not fitting or pleasing to God. And any time you put yourself in an environment that is not pleasing or fitting to God, you are giving demonic oppression access to your life. It's not fitting. But see, demons have to thrive only in places that are not fitting to God that are not pleasing to God. The second that Jesus stepped in that graveyard, it became holy ground. Did you notice that the Bible says when Jesus stepped in, it interfered? 
It stopped what the demons were doing. You want the devil to stop what he's doing in your life? You need to bring Jesus back in your life. And it interfered to the point that it tortured them. And they begged, get us out of here. We can't stand this holiness. Every time you're choosing to live a life that is fitting and pleasing to God, the demonic realm says, get us out of here. We can't stand this. But when you choose to live a life that is unpleasing and unfitting for God, they feel comfortable with you. It tortured them to be in holiness. You know why I admire demons so much? Because they have such loyalty to the devil to the point that holiness tortures them. But there are many Christians that claim to be loyal to God and they surround themselves in an ungodly environment and it doesn't torture them. It doesn't pain you to be around non-believers who are drinking and cursing and getting drunk in the atmosphere that the devil says, this is where I belong, and you see other believers, and they're not tortured by it. You see other believers that are watching things that are unfitting for God, and they're not tortured by it. When the Holy Spirit is in you, ungodliness should torture you. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament that while Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, it tormented him. Because there was so much ungodliness. And if ungodliness doesn't torment you, you're not saved. The Holy Spirit cannot dwell in you and you'll be comfortable in environments and actions and behaviors that are unfitting for a believer. Does it torture you? That's why well, the only thing I say, okay, demons, I look up to you there. Because the second holiness and the environment came in that was wrong for them, they got out. Why don't we have more Christians coming out of ungodly environments? See, you allow demonic oppression to come into your life by your choices. And I don't know what this man did. But notice that the demons begged, we have to be in an environment that doesn't please God. So every time you plug in to worldliness, secularism, ungodliness, you are creating an atmosphere where demons can thrive. Be careful what you involve yourself in. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful who you have a relationship with. Be careful what you watch, because everything you do creates environment. That's why in 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, the Bible says that rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. What a powerful verse Samuel said to Saul. See, that word witchcraft means the demonic realm where Satan can operate. And did you know that I don't have to draw a circle with stars and blood and kill a goat and do a Ouija thing to be in witchcraft? All I have to do is be rebellious towards God. It's not just sin, because we've all sinned. We all sin and make mistakes. But rebellion, however, is choosing to do what is wrong, knowing that it's wrong. Rebellion knows what is right, but chooses to do the wrong anyway. And when you're living a life of complete rebellion towards God, you are opening this environment for the demonic oppression to enter. That's why when you're living in sin and rebellion, you can enjoy church. You can enjoy worship. You can read the Bible the same because the Holy Spirit says you are in violation and living a life that is not fitting for God. And when Saul began to disobey, knowing what was right, notice in 1 Samuel 16, one chapter later, in verse 14, now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, the presence of God, withdrew himself, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. 
Did you notice that all it took for that tormenting spirit to fill him and press him with fear and depression was one chapter before rebellion, sin, living wrong. That's why we have to understand that how you choose to live your life, the choices you make will determine what atmosphere the Holy Spirit or the demonic spirits can dwell. So even though the Holy Spirit can't leave you and you'll never lose your salvation, the Bible says that God withdrew his presence. And the reason so many Christians don't feel the presence of God in their life, in their home, and their personal lives is because of rebellion. You are rebelling towards God and creating an atmosphere, an environment where the demonic realm can oppress you and torment you. See, not only do demons thrive in environment by choices and rebellion, but they really thrive in in emotions that you choose to have. Going back to Ephesians 4.26, the Bible says, do not sin by letting anger control you. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold, an opportunity to the devil. See, you have to understand that the demonic realm can oppress you with your sin, as Ephesians says, and your emotions. Notice that that tormenting spirit, when it tormented Saul, it gave him the emotion of fear and depression. And Paul warns the church, be careful that anger doesn't give the devil an opportunity to work. See, demons can torment a Christian by the emotions that Christian chooses to remain in. Whenever, as a believer, you're living in fear, you're giving the devil an opportunity. So you're watching the news. You hear Corona's up, and fear comes, and worry. And what if there's a shutdown? And what if I lose my job? And the atmosphere changes, and the demon says, yeah, what if you lose your job? And fear controls you. Depression. Anger. You know how many Christians are angry? Not that you get angry, it's that you become an angry person. No one can even talk to you anymore because you blow up all the time. And the devil loves it. Jealousy. Bitterness. Hatred. Are emotions that create an environment for oppression. But notice Ephesians says... Don't let the sun go down. What it's letting you know is those emotions are going to come because the devil is real. You're going to be driving and fear is going to come out of nowhere. Has that ever happened to you? You're going to be, I mean, just normal. You're going to look at someone and say, man, why do I hate them today? Why, Why are they bothering me today? What the Bible says when it comes to sin and your emotions Don't let it settle. Do you know how many people have settled with their sin? Do you know how many people have settled with these emotions that dictate them and control them and oppress them? But you just settled. So many people settle and say, I'm just an angry person. So many people settle and say, I'm just a a fearful person. It's who I am. It runs in my family. How many people settle for behaviors that create environments for oppression and we do nothing about it? So demonic spirits can oppress a believer when God allows it and when our choices allow it and when our emotions allow it. And chances are, it's your choices and your emotions right now that are oppressing you and making your life a mess. Your environment at home, in the car, alone, It's creating an atmosphere where demons say, 
We're comfortable here. We're fine here. So you're saying, well, pastor, what's, what do I do? Clearly, it might be that God's allowing it to develop your character. But what if you're allowing it? Because of what you've allowed in your life, what you've allowed in your home, what you've allowed in your spirit. What, what if you're allowing it with your choices? What if you're allowing it by settling with emotions that don't honor God and aren't fitting as a believer? And the devil just has opportunity with you anytime he wants. Aren't you tired of that? See, now that we've exposed him, can we correct it? Because the Bible says that Jesus came to heal those who were oppressed. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. Solomon says, I look down in my life. Ecclesiastes 4.1. Solomon, one of the wisest people, said, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. So I want to close with this verse. Solomon looks and says, I saw all the oppressed. I saw all the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressor has great power and their victims are helpless. You see, Psalm was saying when you're oppressed, the oppressor is strong. And when you're oppressed, you just want to cry. The oppression is so much, you just want to be filled with tears. The oppression is so much that the Bible says you even feel helpless. The victims of oppression feel helpless. But thank God that in the book of Acts, the Bible says Jesus came to heal oppression. If you're living with fear, if you're living with with anxiety and depression and discouragement, if you feel helpless, you're saying there's oppression in my life, my life's a mess, but I feel helpless as a father, I feel helpless as a wife, I feel helpless as a Christian, I feel helpless right now in my family, I can't fix this. The Bible says you can because Jesus came to heal oppression. If you're under oppression, you can be healed today from that. So, well, Pastor, how? The book of Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus said, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. The idea of a snake was talking about the devil. The idea of scorpions were talking about demons. So Jesus was saying, I have given you authority over himself and demons. You have authority. You have power. You have control. You don't have to live your life defeated thinking, oh, the, the oppressor's too strong. God says you're stronger. You can walk in victory. You can walk in freedom. The Bible says resist the devil. He'll flee. He will leave you. You say, well, pastor, how? Let me tell you something interesting. Having authority is not enough. It's not enough. Many Christians say, oh, I have authority in Jesus' name, and they're still a mess. And I've always wondered that. And I got my answer. I prayed this week. I said, Lord, why is it so many Christians in authority are a mess? And Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Genesis shows us. God said in the beginning of creation, let, it, 
Let us make human beings in our image to be like ourselves. They will reign over. That word reign means have authority over. They will have reign over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth. Mankind is going to have authority over. That's great. Genesis 3, verse 6. The woman was conceived, convinced, sorry, she was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and ate it too. And when I read that, I read this for the first time in years. I never noticed something. Adam had authority over the animals. The devil was a snake. Then Adam should have known, I have authority over this snake. But you know what's mind-blowing to me? Why authority is not enough? We tend to think that Eve was alone. We tend to think that Adam was out in the garden working and the devil got her when she was alone. But the Bible clearly says that she gave some to her husband who was with her. Her. You realize that when that snake slithered in and started talking to the woman, Adam, who had authority, did nothing about it? Do you know that this man saw his wife under attack and he did nothing about it? This man saw his marriage under attack and did nothing about it? What good is having the authority of Jesus Christ when you're going to sit there and watch the devil slither by and destroy your home and destroy your children and destroy your marriage and you do nothing? You sit back and watch the devil destroy everything and you do nothing. You need to man up. We need to say, I have authority. Adam could have stopped him right there, but he did nothing. And I said, man, how many people are watching the devil just slither by? You're watching the devil attack your children. You're doing nothing. You're watching the devil destroy your life and you're doing nothing. Destroy your ministry, you're doing nothing. You're watching the devil destroy your home and your marriage and you, and you do nothing. This is why so many Christians, they're saved and have authority, but they're a mess because church is filled with people that do nothing. In order for the devil to win, you just have to sit there and do nothing. But in order for you to operate in the authority you were given, it's time that you'd stop doing nothing and do something about what the devil is doing in your life. Amen. So, well, Pastor, what do I do? Number one, Get back to a place of worship and holiness. Get back to an environment that is pleasing to God. That means you might have to cancel certain subscriptions. You might have to delete certain numbers. You might have to end certain relationships and friendships. You have to leave certain places. But you have to come back to a place where God says, this is fitting for me. We have to come back to a place of holiness and worship and surround ourselves in a place that makes the devil tormented. Go back to an atmosphere in your home, in your car, when you're alone. Create an atmosphere of worship and praise where the devil feels uncomfortable. Spend time in his word again. Pray again. Worship again. But we have too many Christians doing nothing. 
Why, you think by being here on Sundays, you're doing something? He's going to have you on Monday. Unless you say no. Church ended on Sunday, but worship is still on. Holiness is still on. Do you have an environment where God belongs? Or are your choices telling the devil you fit in here? Because I want to tell you something. I know my church. I love my church. And I know my church is going to leave these doors and say, Yeah! I'm going to do something. I'm going to put on Christian radio. I'm going to read and do a devotional tomorrow. That's a start. And it's cute. But it's not enough. You know, well, Pastor, you're saying that authority is not enough? Now, creating an environment of worship is not enough? No, it's not. You know why? Because the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 14, and 15, when Saul was tormented by the Spirit, David would play the harp. The Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit and filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit of God is troubling you. To the point that people recognize it. But notice the next verse. The Bible says that David, David would play worship. And the Spirit would leave. Why? Because the second David started worshiping God, it created an atmosphere of worship, an environment where the Spirit couldn't dwell. So the first thing I'm telling you is change your environment. If you're being oppressed, ask yourself, what kind of environment have I been in lately? But then I realized something. I wouldn't be telling you the whole truth if I didn't read this verse in 1 Samuel 18, 10 through 11. The Bible says the very next day a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul and he began to rave in his house like a madman. And David was playing the harp as he did each day. But Saul had a spear in his hand and suddenly hurled it at David intending to pin him to the wall. You know what I noticed? There came a point that David started moving and it worked. The atmosphere was changing and and the devil left. But why did the devil come back? The Bible said David played every day. But this time he was overwhelmed and it wasn't working. And I prayed and I said, Lord, why is it that it wasn't working? Why is it that he was worshiping and creating the environment of holiness, but the devil was still controlling him? It's because even though he changed his environment, Saul never changed his heart. He never repented of his sin. So before you leave church and start creating an atmosphere with worship music and prayer and devotionals and Christian television and whatever else you got, make sure before you even start that, you fall on your knees and repent before God and say, change my heart. I am rebellious. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for any demonic oppression now that every person here in this church or listening online be set free in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit today. I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but if this message is touching you in such a way that you know without a doubt you're under oppression, you show me your hands. Your family's under oppression. God bless you all around the room today, all around the room today. It doesn't mean anything, what I just said. If you don't make the choice to repent of your choices and sin and start creating an atmosphere where God belongs. The Lord doesn't belong in ungodliness, unholiness, 
rebellion and sin and hatred and anger and jealousy and bitterness and pride and arrogance. The Lord does not belong there. And if this is how you've been living your life, you may be born again, you may be saved, but you're a mess and under oppression. And today, in the name of Jesus, you're going to be set free. But you have to make a choice to repent and say, Lord, change my heart. I'm sorry for the way I've lived my life. I'm sorry, Lord, that I've used your salvation and protection as an excuse to sin. And today I repent of my sins and will create environments that only you can fit in. And heal me, Lord, of oppression. If that's you today, you put your hand up. God bless you. God bless you. You, you there in the back, you all around the room. Pray this with me today. If you're listening online, you pray with me today. Just say, Lord Jesus, heal me of oppression. Heal my home of oppression. Heal my family of oppression. I have done nothing. I have authority and have done nothing. Forgive me of my sins. I repent and turn to you. Heal me. Set me free. And help me to create an atmosphere of worship. A life that is fitting for your presence to dwell. Create in me a new heart. In Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I pray the blood of Jesus over your life, over your family, over the next generation. May you create an atmosphere in your home where God belongs. May your choices be so fitting that the Lord can dwell. May you continue to grow and strengthen in the Spirit. And may any demonic presence and any demonic oppression leave now. In the name of Jesus, be set free. We pray and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. I hope you guys were blessed by today's message.